What is God's stance towards people who run from him? And throughout the book, we're going to see God's posture towards him. Is he a God that truly, no matter what you do, if you've trusted him for the rest of your life, and then you decide to run for the rest of your life, that he'll never stop loving you? Is he a God that truly loves all people, bad people, which, spoiler, is the only type of people there are. But what is God's heart to the runaway? new series on the book of Jonah to celebrate the Rangers winning game two of them sweeping the Orioles. By a show of hands, who in here would say they are animal people? Okay. Who, who would say they are dog people? Okay. Who would say they are cat people? We're going to have all of you stand so we can lay hands and pray for and then be dismissed from there. Cats clearly seem like a product of the fall and go on record. <laughs> My wife and I are dog people and when we got married, we were not ready for kids, so we decided we'll do a test run and we'll get a puppy. And we decided to get a Rhodesian Ridgeback that ended up being 140 pounds. Now, yeah, a dog that big requires a lot of exercise and so I'm not a runner. So I came up with a solution. Every night I would go to the park and I would just throw a ball and do fetch and get the energy out and then I'd go back home. So at the end of the night, I'd you know, throw clothes on, go down to the park by our house. We lived in the M streets at that time and I'd throw the ball, get energy out, it'd be great. He would ride shotgun with me down to the park and you know, get the energy out and come back. One of these nights, I'm on my way down to the park. I'm, I'm tired, it's the end of the day. I'm wearing slippers for some reason, which is gonna come back up here in a second. I, I never wear slippers at some point, or for some reason I was at this day, particular time. He's riding shotgun, we go, and I see a stray dog in the bushes on the street on the way there. And I am the kind of person that, if I see a stray dog, I feel like I have a moral obligation to stop and at least see if they have tags. If they don't have tags, that's on him. But if they have tags, I feel like, I need to be a good Samaritan and go take this dog to their neighbor. So I get out of the car and I'm, you know, approaching this pit bull and I'm like, hey, hey, buddy, you, you know, who, uh, where's your owner? And he kind of runs further into the bushes and I'm like, oh, don't do this. I, it's late. I'm wearing slippers for goodness sakes. Where is your owner? And he moves a little further. I forget that I had left the car door open to my car. So my 140 pound Rhodesian Ridgeback takes off out of my car and begins running after this pit bull and they both take off. And now I am forced in slippers to be chasing after two dogs that I've lost just in trying to be a good Samaritan. And we're right by Greenville and that Gloria's that was right there and they're running. And like I said, I don't run. So I'm getting further and further, the farther that we're going on and I'm yelling at my dog, his name was Judah. Judah, come back, Judah, come back. And clearly I had not succeeded in training him because he's not listening at all. And he continues to run and the gap is getting further. And I'm thinking I'm going to lose my dog and this other dog because Greenville's a very busy intersection right there you know, in the M streets. And I'm gonna get both of these dogs killed all in an attempt to just you know, save Fido over here. And right before they get to Greenville, another dog owner is walking his dog on a walk and the dog stopped to do the traditional dog greeting, which I'm not gonna go into, but I'm yelling, grab the dogs. And he grabs both of them and I finally run and I finally get there. I put my dog on a leash and I'm carrying Fido with us as we're walking back and he doesn't have it and he takes off again. And I'm like, man, you, this is now between you and the Lord, buddy, you are on your own. We're going home. True story, my car was still parked with the door open running in someone's driveway on Matilda or one of the M streets that was down there. I go back, I'm like, we're not going to the park, get in the car, you know, this is why we can't have nice things and <laughs> go back home. True story, I was so exhausted from running after those dogs that I threw up in the bushes right there by that Gloria's on Greenville, <laughs> which could not have been the first time that that's happened, let's be honest, for very different reasons though, if you will. Now, what does it have to do with the book of Jonah? Well, in that scenario, I clearly discovered the length to which I was willing to go to chase the runaway. That I had reached the limit that, hey, you have blown past 
the willingness that I have to continue to chase after the runaway. In the book of Jonah, we're going to discover God's heart for the runaway. Not just for the stray dog, or certainly not for the stray dog, but for the runaway person, which is a really good topic to explore because at some point in all of our lives, you and I are a runaway. You may be in the room and maybe you're in a season right now where if you were honest, you would say you are running. At some point in all of our lives, if you're a believer, you've had a season of running. And so what is God's heart towards people who are running? All of us have family members, friends, people that we work with who are running from God, who think that their relationship with God and, uh, is something that they want to put in the back burner or, back burner or they don't want to have or God wouldn't want to have. What is God's stance towards people who run from him? And throughout the book, we're going to see God's posture towards him. Is he a God that truly, no matter what you do, if you've trusted him for the rest of your life, and then you decide to run for the rest of your life, that he'll never stop loving you? Is he a God that truly loves all people, bad people, which, spoiler, is the only type of people there are? But what is God's heart to the runaway? And we're going to do so by looking at the book of Jonah. So if you have a Bible, you can flip there. And we're going to look at three questions that parallel to Jonah's story, how we run from God, what running from God leads to, and how far God will go to bring us back to him. Jonah was a minor prophet who lived in around 780 to 750 BC. Now, what's a minor prophet? Does that mean it's less important than the major prophets? No, it means it's shorter. So minor prophets would be Amos, Nahum, Micah, Jonah. Major prophets would be Daniel. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, actually Daniel would be a minor prophet, but the longer one. So it's just a reference to its size. And Jonah is given one of the more unique tasks from God, and he's called to chase after certain runaways. And oddly enough, Jonah himself becomes a runaway in the process. So Jonah chapter one, starting in verse one, if you have a Bible, flip there. If not, it'll be up on the screens. And we would love to give you a Bible if you don't have one. So Jonah chapter one, verse one. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, verse 3, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. So immediately we're told, God shows up to Jonah and says, hey, I want you to go to the nation of Nineveh, or the city of Nineveh, and preach to the Assyrians and preach against this great city. And Jonah quickly says, no. Now, we give Jonah a bad rap and go, hey, why wouldn't you just listen to God? Well, he knew the people that he was called to preach to, things that you may not be familiar with. The Ninevites were some of the most barbaric people in the ancient world. They were an incredibly powerful empire, and Nineveh was the capital of Assyria in the Assyrian Empire. They had mastered the ability to skin people alive. They had conquered or they would conquer lands and they were so brutal to people they'd conquer so that they'd instill fear in other tribes to not rebel against them. They would go into cities and they would take the leadership of the men and they would cut off all of their heads and build a pyramid of their heads outside of that city. They would then take the women and they would enslave them. They had mastered, as I said, the ability to fillet human skin of somebody who's alive. They would take men and trap them in a room and force them to listen to Taylor Swift songs over and over <laughs> and over. Okay, that one is not true. And save the email for all the Swifties that are out there who are going to be on to me for that. But they were an incredibly barbaric tribe. In fact, where they're located, Nineveh is today located in Iraq. In fact, this group was the great, 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 great grandparents of ISIS. So a parallel call on your life to get a similar to why he would run or a modern version of what Jonah was being asked to do would be like God coming to you after the service today saying, hey, I've got a mission for you. I want you to book a plane, an airplane or get on a plane, go over, find ISIS, gather all of ISIS together and give a gospel presentation, tell them how Allah is a false God, Muhammad is a false prophet and invite them to trust in the one true Lord and Savior and have an altar call for ISIS right there. You'd go, that's crazy. That's, that's me asking for my own death. And that's essentially what Jonah interpreted the Lord asking him. So he says, nope, I'm going to head to Tarshish. Now let me show you on the map where Tarshish is. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now he was asked to go to Nineveh and Nineveh was about 500 miles this way. And he decides, actually, I'm going to go 
2,500 miles west in Tarshish, which is in modern day Spain. So he says, I don't really wanna do that. You know what sounds great? Spain, this time of year. The running of the bulls would be fun. I'm gonna get on a boat and head to Spain. And he models in his decision to do so, what running from God looked like for him and really what it looks like for us. The first idea I wanna talk about from Jonah's story is what does it look like to run from God? What does running from God look like? Well, for Jonah, it was disobedience. God had clearly in his word said, I want you to do this. And he decided, I don't want to do that. God had said, hey, I want you to go and I have a call on your life to go be a prophet to these people. And Jonah did what running from God looked like for him and running from God looks like for us. Answering God's word and God's command to do something with disobedience. So what does running from God look like for us? It looks like the same as it did for Jonah. Anytime God's word directly says something we are to do and we look at it and say, no or not now, we, like Jonah, have begun to run. We have a little Jonah in all of us that anytime God's word is clear, hey, this is something I'm calling you to do or something to not do, and we say no, we, just like Jonah, are now running as it relates to God in that arena. If God has commanded in the scriptures, you and I are to forgive as we've been forgiven by Christ. Universally, that there is no limit to the number of people and the number of hurts and the people in your life and in my life that I am called to forgive, even if I don't always feel like it. And certainly if they don't deserve it, I'm still called by Christ to forgive. When I decide, hey, I'm not going to do that because I don't want to, or they don't deserve it. I, as it relates to that arena, have officially begun to run. God's word commands us to live in authentic relationships where we confess sins to one another and experience healing. If I decide, hey, there's an area of my life that, man, I don't want us to talk about, an area of our marriage that, man, I don't want to be open about, and it's clearly a sin that God has said, I am to not have mark my life, participate in, and I decide I'm not going to confess that. As it relates to that area, I have chosen to run. If you're in a dating relationship, young people, and you're dating somebody who doesn't have the characteristics that God says you're to look for in a spouse, and you think, well, you know, I can work with them, and, you know, I'm kind of a missionary, and it's, you know, a lot easier to become a Christian than become hot, and so, you know, let's see if we can, maybe he'll get over across the goal line. You have officially begun to run in that relationship, and we're going to see where running leads to, but there's a little bit of Jonah in all of us. All Jonah did is related to running was God said something clearly just like he speaks clearly in his word. And he decided, I'm not going to do that. Even delayed obedience, delayed obedience is still disobedience. So the idea of like someday I'll get right or someday we'll work it out is still choosing to disobey or choosing to run. Maybe one of the ways that some of us in the room are running is God's call for your life is that you would be connected to a local body that you would be underneath the authority of elders as a source of care and protection and provision in your life, and that you're to not stop meeting together with other believers, and you're to be connected to a church. And you have dozens of reasons why you're not connected yet to a local body, and you haven't got plugged in here, or you haven't got plugged in anywhere, and you're too busy, and there's too much going on, and the requirements are too much. And yet, as it relates to that arena and that command and that instruction, which was given so that you could have life, you are running. And maybe one of the best applications that you can take from today is to decide, hey, I'm actually going to listen to God's word. It says to be connected to a church. Honey, we actually should do that. Or you individually, we should, you, I should do that. And you're going to take that step. You can take that step by scanning this QR code that we had up here earlier. And someone from our staff this week will help you get connected. We want a big place to feel small and we want you to experience the life that comes in living according to God's word. Or, like Jonah, you can keep running, but it's not going to lead to the life that God has for you, a life that Jesus later would describe as the abundant life. But my point in general is, what is running from God looks like? It looks just like Jonah. It looks like I'm not going to do that, despite God being clear. Usually, our running is much more subtle, I will say, than Jonah's, in that he clearly got on a boat and headed the entire opposite direction in what seems to be a very quick amount of time. In my experience, the, the people who run in a season of running often doesn't happen just overnight. It just takes one decision after the next, after the next. It, typically, someone who's abiding with Christ and has a great marriage doesn't just wake up one day and decide, you know what, I think today I'm going to commit adultery and I'm going to ruin my entire life and my children's life and totally destroy so much of the marriage that I've prioritized. No, they get there by one step after the next, 
flirtatious office relationship, becomes an emotional involvement, begins to cross lines, and all of a sudden the decision you never thought you would made, you've made. Because you took one step after the next, after the next. My family, this past summer, we got to go to Florida and I took my kids and we went to the ocean and we were in that 30A area speaking at an event out there and my son loves the ocean. And so I'd go out with him in the ocean and he just loves, he's at that stage where he just wants to essentially fight every wave that comes at him. And he'll go and he's playing out in the ocean and I'll tell him, hey, you gotta stick with me. And he's like, yeah, dad, I'm gonna stick with you. And shortly after that, he'll just continue to move and move and move and move. And he'll look up and he'll be very far from his father not because he was intentionally trying to, just the waves and the current pushed him. He was not intentionally trying not to. And the same is true as it relates to sin and running. That often it's just one decision after the next, after the next. You make the decision, man, it goes from, I just, this helps me cope with a hard day in a glass of wine, which turns to three, which turns to five, which turns to an addiction looking on Instagram and you see some pictures that probably a little bit provocative, but you know, it's nothing nude. And all of a sudden you feed that long enough and becomes, well, you stumbled back into pornography. That it just takes one step after the next, just like in an ocean current, you drift without even realizing it. That's often how running from God looks like. And let me say abundantly clear, there's no person who's run too far, no relationship that has run off course too much, that God cannot restore, no marriage that is too far off, that has drifted too far, that can't be brought back to the heavenly father who loves you and cares about you. And we're gonna see exactly how that can take place. But just like us, when we look at the story of Jonah, there's ways in which we can be runners. In fact, it's a good practice to know, I don't know the areas of your life you're gonna be tempted to run. I know the areas that I could be tempted to run, so to speak, that would be lust. I've shared about my story of pornography and battling that for 10 years from the age 12 into college or battling anger and frustration and being quick with my words or being prideful, all of which are areas that I could be prone and would be prone to run. I don't know what they are for you, but you should so that you can know and have others in your life know and care because of what running leads to, which is what we're gonna see next. Jonah gets on this boat, decides he's gonna run from God, and this is what happens. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. Such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. I love it. All the sailors, there's a storm going on. They're all calling out. They, they're not even selective of their gods. They're just like, you call on your God, you call on your God, calling all gods. We're in a big problem right now. Can we get some help? They threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. So all the storm is taking place and the sailors are freaking out and Jonah's fast asleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us that we will not perish. And the sailors said to each other, come, let's cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. Lots would have been like casting dice. So they're playing Yahtzee to figure out who was responsible for the storm. They cast the lots and it fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us, who's responsible for making all of this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Which Side note, is such a great insertion in the Bible. Of course, a bunch of men sailors, that's the go-to question they're gonna be. It's this typical guy talk today. It's like, oh yeah, so what do you do for work? And versus ladies who are like, yeah, how are you feeling right now, the storm? And what do you do for work? What do you do for work? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. And this terrified them, and they asked him, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because they had, he had already told them. So he'd already told them, hey, I'm a prophet. And so what are you doing here? Well, I decided to retire from being a prophet because I don't want to do what God wants us to do. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do for the sea to be made calm for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied. And it will be calm. I know that this is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. They, they didn't want to do that. They wanted to show mercy on Jonah, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord. 
Please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Second thing that we see is what running from God leads to. Running from God, what does it lead to? Well, in Jonah's case, running from God led to a storm. It led to consequences. And the same is true inside of your life and mine. Running from God, simply put, leads to discipline. Running from God looks like disobedience. And running from God leads to discipline inside of your life. Discipline from God and the consequences of your sin as a part of discipline. God sent a storm into Jonah's life as a force of discipline to keep him from running further. He didn't send that storm into Jonah's life as a source of payback. He sent it as a source to bring him back. And the same is true in your life and in my life, that God doesn't allow the consequences of sin and discipline to happen in your life as a source of payback, but in order to bring you back closer to him. That he, like any good father, is a God who disciplines his children. I'm going to explain what I mean exactly by that here in just one second. But the scriptures over and over say what good parents in the room know, which is if you're going to be a good parent, you have to discipline your children when they are disobedient. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 says this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. Running from God leads to the discipline from the Lord and that discipline is a source of God's love, not as payback, but to bring us back. That God, like any good father, as I said, is a God who will allow the brokenness of your situation, who'll allow the consequences of your sin, he'll allow a DUI to happen, not for payback, but to bring you back. He'll allow the brokenness at your work environment to be a source of growing you and disciplining you to make you look more like Jesus. Like I said, every parent in the room has to go through this at some point. We know if you don't discipline your children, you're setting them up for a lot of problems. I remember growing up in my house, uh, we were a home that was raised around, uh, we were disciplinary, or my parents were for sure disciplinary. They believed in the laying on of hands, if you will. And (laughs) I would get disciplined anytime that I decided I was going to talk back to my mom, or this food is terrible, and I hate peas, and I'm not eating this. And very quickly, once I saw a movement for a paddle or a belt, I was a changed man where I went from, I'm not eating these peas. I'll eat my peas. I'll eat her peas. I'll eat all the peas. I'll eat only peas. I'll eat whatever you do. I, I, I surrender all. I surrender all that I knew that discipline was something I didn't want. But like any good parent, you have to instill a relationship between disobedience and discipline. That as a good parent, we're responsible for knowing, hey, I want to discipline so that when you disobey or when you step outside of God's design and you don't listen to your parents, that you associate that with pain. Why? Because as a parent, I want to instill pain on my children? No, because I want them to associate disobedience with pain as a source of protection. It's exactly what God does inside of our life. He will allow discipline through broken work environments, through challenging home situations, through broken circumstances of this life, not even as a result of sin necessarily, to grow you to look more like Jesus as a source of discipline. The other way that he will allow discipline to happen is he'll allow us to experience the consequences of our sin. That he'll allow that relationship that is really toxic in a dating relationship that God would not have you be in. And you guys have crossed physical boundaries and you know it's not honoring to God and he'll allow that to continue and progress and it to lead to tremendous heartbreak. Not because he wants to pay you back. He's not in the business of retribution. He's in the business of restoration. And so his heart is to bring you back to him who allow that job to fall apart and that burner phone that you have, that you've hidden from your wife, that is how you communicate to an inappropriate relationship that nobody even knows about. He'll allow that to be exposed and left out in the open or the national survey uh, alarm to go off. And all of a sudden it's discovered there's a second phone, not as a source of payback, but to bring you back. God loves you. And he wants you to experience life that is only found in him. And he'll allow us to go through the pain of heartbreak and pain in this life, never for the purpose of paying back, but to bring us back. I mentioned that Ridgeback earlier, because he was so big, it was virtually impossible to pull him on a leash. It was like having like a a baby elephant you're going on a walk with. And so we got something called a static shock collar, which we would put on him. And basically you would push a button and it would make a noise. And if he was going, running towards the street or doing something he wasn't supposed to do, you'd push the noise and beep, beep, beep. And then 
if you didn't listen still, you'd hit the shock. And to save the emails, it wasn't that bad of a shock. I've done it on myself. It's not that big of a deal, people, okay? And <laughs> I don't know why I just had to share. I've done it on myself. But I would push that. And it only took about two times where he was running towards the street and he got that shock and he was very quickly obedient. Now, as his owner, was my heart that, hey, you're not listening and you're running towards the street. So I want to punish you with pain just because I'm angry. No, it was to help him not go towards the street. Why? Because I, I want to save the street all for me. No, because I know that the street can provide danger and harm to him. So it's a source of care and protection, just like with a dog not to pay him back, to bring him back. And that is how God works over and over. And he sends a storm into Jonah's life to bring this prophet back to his will for him. Jonah, we're gonna discover in a couple weeks, he goes into the city of Nineveh and kind of spoiler alert, we'll cover it, cover it in depth in a couple weeks. And he leads what arguably may be the greatest revival in human history. He goes in, preaches a message and the entire city, it says from the least to the greatest, comes to be followers of God. Jonah leads a revival unlike anything maybe has ever been recorded in human history, and he almost missed out on it. He was running from God's will for his life, and God lovingly sent that storm to bring him back to him. And then we see how he finishes inside of that storm. But let me give a side note really quickly, especially for the young adults in this audience. If you're in college, high school students who someday will be young adults, Jonah gets in that boat. He doesn't know those other sailors, as far as we can know. The storm comes on the entire boat. Sailors are not sure what's happening and why this is happening. They weren't responsible for that storm. Why were they experiencing that storm? Because of who's in the boat with them. The same is true in your life that this is why you need to be careful who you date in relationships with, who you walk in community with, who your close friends and relationships with, because you may unintentionally and unknowingly invite a Jonah into your life and storms and challenges and brokenness into your life that you weren't responsible for, but you had someone in, not your boat, but in your phone, in your life, in your dating relationship that caused a lot of pain and a lot of destruction, a storm that was just because you were collateral damage. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20 says, he who walks with the wise becomes wise but the companion of fools suffers harm. It doesn't say he who walks with the wise becomes wise, the companion of fools becomes a fool. It says he who walks with the wise becomes wise. But if you walk with fools, you suffer for it. And maybe the thing that you need to do is say, I'm, I'm gonna choose that this is somebody that I can minister to from afar, but they're not gonna be in my boat of life. They're not gonna be in my dating relationship. They are out, I am tossing this Jonah off of the boat of my life not because God doesn't love them and because he doesn't want the best for them, but because their disobedience may bring destruction into your life and pain that is collateral just by being near. Finally, we see how the story ends and the length to which God will go to bring runaways back to him. Then they took Jonah and they threw him overboard and the raging sea grew calm. What a eerie moment that must have been. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows or commitments to him. They go from worshiping these pagan gods and different gods to worshiping the one true God and making worship and sacrifices to him, commitments to him. Now the Lord, as Jonah is sinking in the ocean, provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. I'm gonna come back to that last section, but I wanna look at how far God is willing to go to bring back the runaway. What is the answer? As far as it takes. We see that most fully in Christ, which I'll point to in a second, but look at the lengths he's willing to go to with Jonah, that he's willing to send a storm and then he's willing to send a fish. And the point of the fish was to bring Jonah back to him and bring him back to God's will for his life. I mean, when we hear the story as a kid, the focus is always on the fish and the fish is such a small part of this entire narrative. The fish is not really that important in the story. In fact, the fish honestly is just a means of transportation. The fish is God's first Uber, where he's like, I'm gonna pick you up and take you over to Nineveh. And then the fish exits the scene when he vomits him up on dry land. 
What is the point of the story is the willingness of God and how God chases after the runaway, that he chases after him by sending a storm, that he chases after him by sending a fish to bring him back. The other runaways that we see he's chasing after are the Ninevites. Ninevites were pagan people, had no worship of God. They had nothing to do with God. And yet God has a heart for people who are far and lost from him. That God's heart for every person who's ever lived, just like these evil, wicked Ninevites, is that they would know him. God's heart currently in the nation of Israel, there's been for the very first time since 1973, a declaration of war and terrorist attacks that have been taking place for the last 48 hours from a terrorist group named Hamas. Most of us probably are familiar with that. God's heart for every person in Israel and every person that's a part of Hamas is that they would know him, that God is a heart that loves and chases after the runaways. And candidly, there's runaways on both sides. Just like Jonah was a Jewish runaway, so there's Jewish men and women inside of the city of Jerusalem that are Jewish runaways. They don't actually know Jesus. They don't know the one true God because they don't know Jesus, just like they're on Hamas. And God's heart for both, just like God's heart for every coworker, every person, every family member that you have ever met is that they would know him. He's a God who loves the runaways. And he's chasing after the Ninevites as he chases after this prophet. The other group of runaways that we see that God chases after is these sailors. They get in their boat. They think they're just bringing, you know, some different supplies. They're going to have a merchant exchange in Tarshish. And God sends a storm that was not of their own choosing. And yet that very storm is what leads them to worship, not their pagan gods, the one true God. God loves the runaway. God chases after the runaway. Maybe you're in the room and it's your first time at church in a while. Maybe ever. Maybe you don't even know, you know, where you stand as it relates to Jesus and God. And if you're honest, you think if God is really real, he doesn't probably want anything to do with me because of something you're in your past or something in your present or something in your life. Here's the good news that we learned from Jonah, which is good news for all of us because all of us are or were runaways. God chases and loves the runaways. He most clearly showed that on the cross. I mean, as humanity, man has been running from God since its creation. In Genesis chapter three, we're told that God, after in one and two, he makes all of mankind, everything is perfect and right and good. And God sets them up in paradise. And very shortly in, man decides, I don't want to worship God or be made in the image of God. I want to be God and rejects him. And humanity begins to run. And what was the response of God towards humanity? To crush, destroy, start over, it was to run after him. Most clearly seen in Jesus on the cross, 700 years after this moment take place, we see that God is a God whose heart is for runaways. In fact, today, Yom Kippur was two weeks ago. Yom Kippur is the biggest Jewish celebration that Jews have. And on Yom Kippur, do you know what they read? The book of Jonah. Yom Kippur means day of atonement. They celebrate the atonement of God, God's provision for them, which we know ultimately happened in Jesus. But why of all things would they read that book? because it reminds Israelites today, our God has a heart for all people that he has been chasing. And he's been chasing you from the moment you took your first breath to the moment you take your last, because that's by his DNA, who he is. And he showed this most clearly in Jesus who would show up and show the lengths to which God will go to bring back the runaway, even my own life. What's interesting about Jonah is how Jesus references Jonah over and over. And he says it connects to him. On multiple different occasions, Luke 12, Matthew 12, Matthew 16, Jesus talks about this scenario and he says, brings up Jonah being in the belly of the fish. Here's one example where he says, hey, there's not gonna be a sign that I'm gonna give to prove I'm the Messiah, except for one. And that will be the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was in, the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So the son of man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. What is he saying? Well, he's pointing to what scholars have long held that Jonah, when he was in that fish, how could he have lived for three days? What was he eating? Was he eating seaweed? Well, most likely, no, he was dead and he rose again, which is why Jesus, it's one of his favorite analogies. The sign of Jonah is what you will see with me, that he was in the belly of the fish and he came back alive. And the same will be true of me. In other words, Jesus wasn't sleeping and hanging out in the tomb, that he was dead. And then he came back alive. Why? Because he's a God who would lay down his life to chase after the runaways. It's who he is. This is our God, the God of Jonah, the God who is Jesus, the God who Paul would later even emphatically punctuate 
how much this is who our God is and his heart for humanity, his heart for you. What he would write in Romans chapter five, and he is writing about the love of God and the lengths to which God goes for runaways. But he uses a different word, an even more powerful word, even more scandalous word. He says this, Romans chapter five, verse eight. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 10. While we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Paul just said, God is a God who dies for his enemies? That God is a God whose love is not just for somebody who, who's running from him and fleeing, his love is even for those who are his enemies. There is no love like that in any other world of religion. This is what sets Christianity, and one of the things that, many things that set Christianity apart from every other world religion, there's no other world religion that says God is a God who is so loving that he will lay down his own life, not for people who worship him, not for people who love him, for people who are his very enemies. Because his DNA and the fabric of his character is he is a God who chases after runaways. And we get to go share that message with the world that is in desperate need of hearing. There's a God who's not angry at them, who's not done with them, who wants a relationship with them, who proved it in saying that he would go to any length, even the life of his only son on the cross. And we get to take that message to the world. This is who God really is. He chases after runaways like Jonah, like the Ninevites, like the sailors, like me, and like you. And if you're here this morning, or you're listening online, or you're listening at a later day, let me be abundantly clear. This is the reason you're here. If you don't have a relationship with God, it's because God is pursuing you. The fact that this is on right now is not just because it randomly popped up on YouTube or not because you just got randomly invited by a friend and you're just in town for some birthday celebration or dedication or something that's going on. The reason you're in the building and the reason you're on the planet is because God wants a relationship with you because that's who he is. And he chases after runaways. And then he uses us to be a part of sharing and being like Jonah and taking that message to a world full of runaways. There's a God who loves them. And for those of us who do know Jesus, we get to decide today and tomorrow, will we be more like Jonah? Apathetic, disobedient, uncaring, or like Jesus? In so many ways, they have interesting parallels where Jonah failed at everything Jesus succeeded at. Jonah ran from his enemies. Jesus ran towards them. Jonah was all about self-protection. Jesus poured himself out in self-sacrifice. Jonah was a sinner who ran from God. Jesus is the God who runs towards sinners. Jonah needed a savior. Jesus is Jonah's savior. And he's your savior if you trust in him and his death and his resurrection. Those three days in the belly of the earth where he defeated death and did the sign of Jonah because he's a God who chases runaways.